Great Philosopher's Guide to Data Governance or some musings from some pop stars and some other random thoughts I've recently come up with and some other stuff from me too, obviously, because it's my deck, so we're going to go through what I want to go through. And uh, maybe there's a little bit of clickbait in this. That's okay. But we already have your cookies, so let's just get going, shall we? Really? I got to do this in front of everybody? Truth and meaning. That's what the philosophers look at, don't they? That's what they all try to consider. What is truth in life? What is the meaning of our existence? I'm not here to answer all those for you personally. I'm here to focus on kind of truth and meaning in the data space. And I can sum up my entire philosophy about data into three words. Truth before meaning. You need to determine the truth in your data through data management, data governance, before you spend any of that time de uh, deriving meaning out of analytics and business intelligence, data science, and that whole crowd over there. I am distinctly on the truth side, hence the meaning of my truth hat here. That's my team, and we can, we can find that. A Little bit about me, in case you haven't wondered, Wondered, uh, been wondering yet? Yeah, spoiler alert, I don't do a whole lot of whispering. Okay, we save the whispering for the data. All of us in the data management space, you are all data whispers. We gotta calm data down in our organization. Data is unruly, data is corrupt, data is unstructured, data needs to get calmed down in our organization. I think we all do that. We have, but outside of that, we have got to sell, tell, and yell about the power of data management and data governance. That's a theme I've heard this entire conference. We get it, but the people outside of this room who aren't here, who wonder why you're even traveled here, they don't get it in our organization. Hopefully I can share some tips with you today on how to kind of break through and get above that fray. My company, Boutique Consul uh, Consultancy, Meta Meta Consulting, we're about what it's about. No, we're not gonna change our name to Facebook, Facebook, that's not happening. I provide data evangelism as a service. How do we get people fired up about the work that we do? How do we make data governance exciting? I know that's a question a lot of you have been dealing with for decades here, but there is something about it that we know can reach out and grab the hearts and minds of our business leaders. And as Tony mentioned, I am the why, not the how. You need both. You gotta know how to do what you do, and many of you are great experts in that, but I haven't met a CEO out there who will give anybody money for the how until they understand the why. So you gotta have a balance there for sure. I do a ton of content. I wrote a whole book about how to explain the power and value of data management to your organization on the business side. Telling your data story, data storytelling for data management, 99% buzzword free. I didn't want to overpromise. And I did a, a virtual uh, world tour across 35 DEMA chapters this year. Talked to, it was great. One day I did Germany and then Indiana and then Peru. That was fun, could never do that physically. But uh, I wanna thank the DEMA folks for helping me do that. And uh, Mary Lou and Peter, there's 50 more chapters out there, so help me get to them, will ya? I do a tremendous amount of content. As I said, if you haven't seen my puppet show, required viewing for the data management space here, too much tech talk with a couple of my characters, the CDO, the chief dog officer, and the ITB who speaks only in buzzwords. And uh, on Friday, I'll be relaunching again the 12 days of data management. Yes, starring as well two of my friends here, Susan uh, Walsh and George Furikan, as well as a host of other wonderful data folks. And there's an unusual amount of puppet activity in the data management space. And finally, I'm disruptive. People try to be disruptive. You want to be disruptive in technology, don't you? So I've been disruptive since the fourth grade. This is my fourth grade picture here. See if you can pick me out. There I am. I don't really think I've changed that much. In my report card, my teacher wrote, Scott is disruptive and distracting to others. So I, I always took that as a compliment. So today is really about new ways to think and talk about what you already know. You already know how to do this. You know how to do this way better than I do. We all have a part to play. I feel mine is, how do you get that CEO, how do you get this business leadership to understand what the heck we're talking about here? So I'm gonna give you a bunch of tips and ideas and thoughts and as I said, some random musings around that. So when I talk about truth before meaning, to dive a little bit deeper, determine the truth first, 
data management, data governance, data quality, data stewardship, master data reference, data MDM, RDM, PIM, DAM, all those foundational activities we all know we have to do to curate and steward and govern that core content that actually flows through everything we do. Everything in an organization, master data, reference data, metadata, touches all of it. I'd like to know whether a department that can claim that. I don't think there are any. Versus deriving meaning, business intelligence, analytics, data science, data literacy, visualization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. So I bifurcate the space on purpose this way. And just to not get too confrontational, it's kind of us versus them a little bit. So when you think about data storytelling, super hot topic today, probably the hottest non-technical topic going on. You take a look at all the work going on in the data storytelling space, all of it is about business intelligence storytelling. How to take data and put it in a business context to drive action, super important, gotta do it, but where's the voice of data management and all that? Where's the voice of data management and stories about using data? I tried to be that voice, help you be that voice through my book, so there's one book versus nine or 10, but it's a story, data story, uh, data management storytelling really about making data versus using data. Every enterprise needs both. This is not Sophie's choice here. You don't need to choose which one you're gonna do. Every organization has to do both. Stories about using data, stories about making data. My first philosopher, Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Oh, I've been practicing that all week. I blew it. All right, everything flows. All entities move. Doesn't that feel like what we do in data? All your data is moving all the time. All these entities, these customer entities, these product reference files, all moving, all changing. And this Greek philosopher from way back somehow was able to kind of grab on and, and share with us the view we live every day today. Moving a couple centuries forward, Leonardo, everything connects to everything else. In this digital world we live in, everything does connect to everything else. Think about it. Think about the IoT, Internet of Things. Everything connects to everything else when it should. That's the one sentence business requirement of the IoT. Everything connects to everything else when it should. Should means privacy, should means security, should, should means identification, validation, all those things we do in data governance, data management to validate an entity to make sure it connects. I mean, I'd love for my bed to connect to my coffee maker. That's a wonderful <laughs> consumer experience. But my coffee maker should not talk to my lawnmower under any circumstances. <laughs> So we need identification in the Internet of Things. Of course, that's critical. But when you spell out identification, Internet of Things, it's idiot. <laughs> There's a warning there somewhere. <laughs> Mozi, the great Chinese philosopher, had this three-pronged test he applied to any doctrine, any belief, any, I would suggest to you, any data. Ask yourself these three things, which you do for sure on any data source coming in. Question its basis. Can it be verified? How can it be applied? We think about that with data. Is it right? What is it? Where's the value? We ask ourselves this all the time. So there was a great philosopher from the ancient times who had a view of how to strategically look at data governance. And going, let's go to the Bible here for inspiration. As long as they all spoke the same language, no endeavors were beyond their reach. I heard earlier, we don't all have the same definition of data governance, do we? We don't all speak the same language. Master data is often referred to as the common language for an organization. If you have standards in your vertical, that is the common language between parties. We need common language on, a data, on the data side to be able to interoperate and connect and drive things at scale. I don't know about you, but the Tower of Babel certainly looks like the first data silo. <laughs> Speaking of the Bible, the golden rule, the golden rule of data, do unto your data as you would have it do unto you. What you put into data management, you get out of business intelligence. G-I-G-O, commonly known, right? Garbage in, garbage out, goodness in. Goodness out, what goes up must come down. What goes in comes out. So whatever you do in data management will find its way into business intelligence. We have to keep reminding people of that. 
So you put garbage data into ERP, you get a lousy ERP. Put bad data into CRM, you get missed customer opportunities. You put bad data into FinTech, you will get a visit from the regulators. Bad data into ML, bad robots. Bad data into BI, BS. <laughs> bad data into AI, AS, artificial stupidity. <laughs> no matter how you slice it or how you dice it, the golden rule of data prevails. Do unto your data as you would have it do unto you. Moving a little more into the future here, the great food philosopher Julia Child. Every great chef can still use bad ingredients. She never said that. She never said anything like that, okay? Data's like cooking. You don't have to cook fancy or complicated masterpieces, you data scientists out there. Just good food from fresh ingredients. Food is a great analogy to use when you describe data in your organization. Because no chef, no matter how great they are, no tool, no matter how fancy it is, can produce a good tasting meal unless the ingredients are of high quality. Very simple, very simple way to explain it. Here's some more quotes. Again, I'm picking on the, any data scientists in the room? Because I'm going after you today. All right, good, then we're, because <laughs> their attitude is what gets me. So these are quotes I have heard at conferences from data science and business intelligence leaders. Data has no value until it's turned into analysis. Without analytics, data is just a cost center. Data on its own is useless. I, I hate this bullshit. <laughs> when is this gonna stop? You hear your analytics leader get up there and say, oh, that data is nothing till I do my work. That's your work they're talking about. Let's stand up for ourselves, all right? You'd never hear a baker get up here and say, oh, that flour's worthless until I turn it into bread because they respect the ingredients. And I reach out to the entire analytics community and say inspect and respect the ingredients. We are partners in this. And when the business people hear a, an analytics person get up there and say, data has no value, they look at you and say, what am I paying you for? What's all this for? Why are we doing this? They hear us bicker and we can't agree amongst ourselves and they leave the room with our funding. So we've got to stay on the same side here. It's not a zero sum game between business intelligence and data management, although I often see it characterized that way. I hate this stuff. Let's get back to some real philosophers here, shall we? Frederick Nietzsche, who has a why, can bear almost any how. Back to my why and how. So if you explain that why, they can bear this kind of how. <laughs> Anybody ever start their data governance strategy discussion with something like this? <laughs> you should be kicked out of the office. This is 100% how. You got to do it. It's got to work. I get it but it's in order. It's not chicken or egg here, it's egg and omelet. You need that why before you get to that how. Now, the Canadian philosopher, I thought I'd put this up here for all our Canadian friends are going, Canadian philosopher? <laughs> Who could that be? Avril Lavigne, why'd you have to go and make things so complicated? <laughs> Let's hear it for Avril there, right? And we do, we do that, we make it so complicated with the words we use and the phrases we use. Analytics, graph, hub, fabric, mesh is gonna change everything, whatever that is. Like that makes sense to our business leaders. It does not, so I'm gonna pick on a bunch of them here just for fun. Lakehouse. I'm sure there's some technical aspects to this that are very important, but Lakehouse, is that where my data goes on vacation? <laughs> ETL, no, ELT, no, reverse ETL. I know some of you know what that means. I have no clue. Reverse ET, BLT is what I'm looking for. <laughs> ML, auto ML. I looked at that one. Isn't machine, aren't machines already automatic? That's like calling a self-driving car an auto automobile. Yeah. And I was in the exhibit hall yesterday, and I'm not gonna say the name, but one of the vendors told me about this brand new service they've got, platform as a service with governance as a service. They call it pass gas. That's an elevator pitch you do not want to hear. <laughs> SQL. 
Big sequel fans here, right? A lot of big sequel fans. Or is it no sequel? Which one is it? Who knows what the N-O stands for in no sequel? What does it stand for? Not only. Not only. The world's shortest acronym. N-O means not only. Only in the data world does no equal yes. <laughs> this is a problem we are all dealing with. Can you imagine a, a, a data scientist walks into a Starbucks. They go, I'll have a no foam, no whip, no chai latte. Oh, you mean you want a latte? No, I said not only whip, not only foam, not only chai. My sequel? Guess what? It's not your sequel. It's named after the daughter of the guy who came up with my sequel. That's wonderful, but who knows that? Who understands that when they hear that? Here's a soft skill tip for you. Don't come up with a term that you gotta be in the room to explain. This is gibberish to the rest of the world. So what's it all about, Alfie? I'll give credit to both Deanne, Deanne Warwick and Michael Caine on this one. What's it all about? What is our business all about? What is what we do in data governance all about? Why do we do it? It is about aligning to the strategic intentions of your enterprise. It is about the reason your business exists. And I'm not one of those guys who goes, every company's a data company. No, unless you make data. I work for Dun & Bradstreet. I work for Nielsen. Those are data companies. You might use data at your organization, but if you're a manufacturer, I hate to break, you're not a data company, you're not an internet company, you're not a software company unless that's what you produce. Because every enterprise on earth, the reason for being is to provide value to your relationships through your brands at scale. That's the point. That's the point of your business. And at scale, that's your opportunity. That's where you come in. Scale means technology. Technology, hardware, software, data. If you have data, you need data management. I rest my case. But that's the essence of your business. And when you think about it, the words you use to describe this very generic term here, but try and make it personal to your own business. When we say relationships, what do we mean by that? It could be customer, vendor, partner, prospect, citizen, patient, client. The people you partner with and sell to and buy from the relationships, most important part of your business, the data about your relationships, the most important data you have in your business. You don't have relationships, you don't have a business. Simple as that. And when we say brand, what do we mean by that? Is it product, is it service, is it offering, is it a location, is it a finished good made up of ingredients and materials? Those of you who are steeped in MDM have probably recognized all these words on here. Classic master data domains. The most important data in your organization, you're welcome to quote me, is the data you've got about this stuff. So when we hear people talk about feature engineering, the features are about the instances, the attributes are about the entities, the columns are about the rows. The silos you have need a foundation, you have all these verticals, you need a horizontal. There's some common geometry here. What, what do we do in general? We align the rows. You can take two spreadsheets, try and bang them together, anybody can add columns but the rows are hard. And the rows are customer, the rows are product, the rows are what the columns are about. And when we say value, it's about growing your business, improving your business, protecting your business. Really the only three ways I've seen companies get value out of data. Grow your business, increase sales. Improve your business, operational efficiency. Protect your business, mitigate risk. Again, you can do that all three of those things with data. And if you've got great master data, you can do all three of those things, sometimes with the same record. Again, let me hear another department say they can do that. So what's it all about? Let's take the uh, page from the Ratso Rizzo School of Strategic Planning. Don't forget the money. And that money is what you get when you provide value to your relationships through your brands at scale. Now let me talk a little bit about Tess here. I don't know if you know Tess, wonderful. She was on this uh, 
nightly news edition that Lester Holt did right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I saw this and it just struck me as a really great example of what probably our business leaders are thinking when we talk. So Tess asked this wonderful question. Everyone is talking about flattening the curve. What is the curve? She didn't know. We think all the people we talk to know the language we use. They don't. We gotta use this business accessible language. Use the terms they already understand. You can map it in your head to what it means in the data space, but we've gotta get the business side past this idea of asking us, why do we do data? Why are we doing that? We gotta get past that. Now speaking of kids, I'll bring up one of mine here. Dataversity posted my video a couple weeks ago. If you haven't seen this, you gotta check this out. The Little Red Data had a cautionary tale about the lack of stakeholder engagement co-starring Data Whisperer Jr., my grandson, who asked me this wonderful phrase at the end, Pop, Pop, is data the new oil? Let me take that one down for you. Who's used this? I'm sure you, you don't have to raise your hand because you know I'm going to pick on you. You see this graphic all the time, been plaguing presentations for the last five years when people are trying to talk about how valuable data is. So is data the new oil? Oh, it's like oil because you need to refine it and you get value out of it once it's, once it's refined and, and worked with. No, it's not like oil because you, you can reuse it and it doesn't pollute. The, I don't even know what side I'm on but whether it's a metaphor or a simile, the fact that we have multiple fractions discussing what this actually means, means it's bad poetry. It's not making the point we wanna make. If we as a group can't agree what data the new oil means, you think the audience that's listening to you for the first time hearing this understands it either? No, say no to dit no. And if you're using this graphic ever, read the whole thing, will ya? The world's most valuable resource is no longer oil but data, fine. The data economy demands a new approach to antitrust rules, really? Regulating the internet giants, huh? You think this is a positive story about data? It's not. So I hope we can eradicate this bad poetry in our space here that's confusing people. And in terms of data being new, it's not new. There's some cave person drawings that looks like data to me. So, if cave people were making their own data by using Flintstone logic, data is actually older than oil. So I proved my case with that. <laughs> data isn't new, it's not new. Before there were computers, before there were electricity, William the Conqueror in 1086 in England, they had just gotten themselves out of that Y1K problem and then he commissioned <laughs> He commissioned the Doomsday Book, which was, an which was a catalog of everybody in the country and everything they owned. Sure looks like data to me, doesn't it? So data is not new. Let's use words and phrases that have the right kind of meaning, meaning for our audience. IT can be scary. <laughs> Don't leave your data alone with IT. I, they forgot what the I stands for. That's the problem. But technology can be a glittering lure. It attracts our attention. We want to get that new brand new thing that'll fix the stuff that we just bought last week that was going to fix the stuff that we bought two months ago. That's a problem in our space. We've all got to really have the hard conversation with ourselves about what it really means to focus on the business first. And so uh, a little side note here, Don Draper, a personal hero of mine, nobody can pitch like Don Draper for his behavior at work, not at home. That was a different narrative. You were a Mad Men fan. But if you want to learn how to pitch, watch Don Draper pitch. No one pitches like him. And my own summary of it and the essence of every pitch he ever did was, it's not about the thing, it's about how that thing makes you feel. And that's what we want from our business leaders. We want them to feel like the strength we are giving them is going to help them power through the business activity that they've got. Make sure they feel that as well. Not just see it, but feel it. My last little beat here, I see and kind of always thinking about how you think about data. And I saw some parallels between music and data. They're both types, they're both content. 
And so thinking about the evolution, if you will, and suspend your disbelief on this too literally, but the evolution of content creation, distribution, monetization, and governance, very similar to the journey we've taken in data. So many of us started off, show of hands here, who started off listening to music on those siloed LPs? That really fragile stuff, right? You have to like take it and put it on the little turntable and make sure you don't get a scratch that then destroys that song for the rest of your life. Nyah, 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 nyah. You hear that skip, almost anticipate it. Then we move to cassette tapes where at least we can make our own little playlist to a certain degree. Then we got to CDs where we had to buy everything over again, didn't we? CDs, very violent medium. We rip CDs, we burn CDs. <laughs> when I ripped the CD, that was the first time for me personally, data or music appeared like data. There was metadata in there. I could align everything. I could spell it all the same way and I could put it on this wonderful single uh, unit, single device, an iPod or whatever MP3 player you use and completely transformed the way I accessed my data. Now I can stream it wherever I want, whenever I want. I can get access to that content in any context that I want to, which is what we want our business folks to have in terms of access to data. So I think there's kind of some similarities here, but it's always about the content. I'm still, you know, I bought Miles Davis Kind of Blue five times already because that's the content I want. So the delivery mechanism is one thing and technology is a glittering lure, but if that content isn't what they want, they're not gonna be able to absorb it and get value out of it. So an example of an unintentional, while she's a pop goddess, Taylor Swift, I believe she's also an unintentional deity for the power and value of strategic data management. Just bear with me here, let me explain it to you. So just a little other sidebar, Taylor Swift and I, I think we have a little bit in common. I did a Google alert on me and I came up Travis Scott Taylor Swift, so that was <laughs> something. I'll take that adjacency. <laughs> but I think there's a lot to learn from Taylor about how she manages and governs and monetize her content slash data slash music. So, First of all, she loves metadata. Check this out, look at all those tags. <laughs> she also understands governance. If you remember when Apple came out with its first streaming service, she wrote this open letter, which was a little bit daring of her because uh, she wasn't quite sure how it was gonna land and just basically said, hey, that's my content. You can't do whatever you want with it. We gotta govern it and monetize it and manage it in a way that we all understand and believe it. She delivers it in every medium. So no matter what, it's integratable into everybody's legacy system or current analytics graph fa ha fabric mesh for music, whatever they use to deliver that content. And finally, this last thing she's done to re-record all of her content. She said, it's not governed the way I want to. It's certainly not monetized the way I agree with. I'm gonna re-record re uh, all of my content and so now I own it again. So if you just go with me on this, I think there's a lot to learn from Taylor Swift about the power and value of data governance and data management. And I hope we kind of take this to heart and have leaders who are more like Taylor Swift. Again, you can quote me on that if you want to. So finally, what do we gotta do? How do we do it? We gotta build that circle of trust. <laughs> that circle of trust according to De Niro that circle of trust about our data to provide consistent, dependable, accurate, complete, quality content for whatever they need. For AI, for ML, for data science, for operations, for legal, for finance, for marketing, for every department in our organization, we are the source of it. And bring them into that circle of trust. And you are right, okay? We are right here. You are right, data will help your company, the benefits are tangible, the advantages are undeniable, the urgency is real. We all believe the same thing about data. We all believe the same thing, we might say it differently, but we all believe that same thing. So the value of every digitally transformative customer initiative, every as a service offering, every foray into e-commerce, every data science algorithm, every enterprise software implementation is inextricably linked to the successful output of your data governance efforts. That's the longest version of GIGO I could come up with. 
So truth before meaning here. And as data management leaders, as data governance leaders, you can steward the truth. You can govern the truth. You can manage the truth. You can handle the truth in your organization. Uh, give yourselves a hand on that one for sure. So wrapping up, pro tip, if you don't know how long you're going to go, put a long summary slide. If you need more time, read it, but I'm out of time, so we'll keep going here. Good decisions made on bad data are just bad decisions you don't know about yet. I'm Scott Taylor, the Data Whisperer. I want to thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you.